So I want to take a couple minutes to talk to you about growth, and really the issue is sustainable growth. And whether you're a fast-growing insurgent from an emerging market or a very established incumbent multinational, one of the things that we've discovered and, and really looked at on the question of growth is this topic of do you still have the founder's mentality? And what I want to do is to try to define that and talk about some of the things that happens to companies that blows them off track uh, from retaining that founder's mentality. Bain has been looking at the issue of um, how companies grow sustainably uh, for at least 40 years. And one of the things that's quite fascinating is when you look at the, um, the annual reports of the Global 2000, on average, the leaders of those companies are projecting to outgrow their markets by two times. That's on a revenue basis and on a profit basis to grow, uh, to outgrow their markets by four times. And so it's a reasonable question to ask on any sustained basis over a 10 year period, how many companies actually outgrow their market uh, by two times? And the answer is roughly one in 10. And that means 90% of companies are gonna fail to achieve their basic growth ambitions. And when you ask about that 90% and you say, what was it that led to the failure for you to sustain that growth. The fascinating thing is only in roughly 15% of cases do the management team cite the markets. They don't blame the markets. When they look and reflect on what happened, they mostly cite internal issues, be it their organizational complexity, what's happened to their culture, inability to get resources at the right point of attack, et cetera, et cetera. And this has led to um, us in the way we think about growth to say it isn't simply how you compete in the market, how you drive to leadership. There is something that happens internally as companies grow that either lead to their success or lead to their downfall. And we talk about it on two dimensions. And we say, first, to what degree is the company still retaining its sense of founder's mentality? And to what degree is the company benefiting from the scale and scope that comes with growth? And what we see is in most cases, companies start as fantastic insurgents, very high founders mentality, no scale and scope whatsoever. But as they grow, the default path is they move into incumbency, gaining huge benefits of scale and scope, but losing that original insurgent culture. By definition, one of the main things that you lose is founder mentality, and that's huge. Founder-led companies are insurgents. They are at war against their industry on behalf of a dissatisfied um, customer. And this leads to sort of an extraordinary sense of nobler mission, a long-term view of what you're doing with the company. The other thing you lose is the owner mindset. Um, owner mindset is this incredible cost mentality. Everything, everything is your money. It is this notion of being um, absolutely biased to action, hatred of bureaucracy, and it's this personalization of risk. It's your money. So it's quite interesting. With founder-led companies, they're much more likely to pilot a lot, but then if they've got a winning proposition, they're going to bet it all. In contrast, incumbents, large multinationals, will pilot a lot, but then never actually back a bet. They'll just continue to spend a little money everywhere rather than betting it all on something that's working. And the final definition is this obsession with the front line. That means they're talent obsessed, customer obsessed, advocacy obsessed, and everything is about translating the strategy into frontline behaviors, frontline actions. One of the things that we find extraordinary is with incumbents, you can work for weeks in discussions about strategy without any leader talking about how it will impact the front line. For founder-led companies, it's incomprehensible to talk about strategy without talking about the front line. So that is a huge amount to lose culturally. On the other hand, you're growing and you're gaining from the benefits of scale and scope. So let's investigate what you gain. First, leadership economics. Who wouldn't want to be a leader in their industry with extraordinary opportunity to put purchasing pressure on the supplier to be able to give customers more and more? You begin to gain a proprietary set of assets and capabilities. You have better brands. You have better capabilities with people. You have good IT systems that collect customer feedback. All extraordinary. And you benefit from the economics of scope. You're in multiple countries. You learn from those countries. You can roll out the next product that much faster. And that's part of the problem is that the benefits of scale and scope are very real. And therefore, over that time from insurgency to incumbency, the perception may be that the company is continuing to benefit. 
because the benefits of scale and scope overwhelm the cost of losing founder mentality. But now you're an incumbency. And now you're a different company. You've got tremendous scale and scope, but none of that original culture. And what we're seeing there is the struggle is now that scale and scope is no longer a benefit. It is complexity and it is dragging you south towards a struggling bureaucracy. One of the things that we argue is awareness of the winds. We refer to these as the westward winds. Awareness of what are the pressures that lead you on this default path. If you understand what is going on, you can then develop actions to mitigate that. So let's talk about those winds. What, what happens to insurgents that can lead them into this incumbency trap? First thing is revenue grows faster than talent. By definition, these are fast growing companies. You want your revenue to be growing faster than talent. But what you do during that period to address that can make or break a company. The second thing is the erosion of accountability. When companies are very small, discussions are about real things. You talk about customers. You talk about the product line profitability and what to do with pricing, what to do with cost. As companies grow, there starts to be the rise of averages. So you talk about average customers. You talk about one of the most insidious phrases in business, average gross margin. And people end up in conversations about things that actually have nothing to do with the business. They are the math of the business. And when you're at that level of abstraction, it is no wonder that people no longer feel accountable for activity because there is no discussion of activity. There's a discussion of math. Then there's this issue of the lost voice of the front line. This is inevitable, but it's insidious. When you start, the people around the table that are making decisions for the company are people that are selling the product and talking to customers every day. Then two things begin to happen. The first of which is you begin to bring in functional professionals for all the right reasons. But you have a head of HR, you have a head of finance, you have a head of supply chain, and these are additional voices around the table. And then the business gets complex enough that you don't actually have the front line at the table. You have span breakers that you've put in who manage the front line. And you get into a situation where nobody around the table is actually part of the front line of the business and the voice of the front line begins to be eroded and very bad things can start happening. And then the final thing is the unscalable founder. One of the things that we're very clear about in our research is the founder can be the problem. The phrase we use is founder mentality, not the founder, because sometimes the founder himself or herself is the issue. One of the westward winds that we've talked about a lot is this issue of revenue grows faster than talent. So we've spent a huge amount of time with founder companies. And what they say is, we don't have a growth problem. We have a sustainable growth problem. Our issue is we can't keep the organization growing and scaling at the pace that our revenue grows and scales. And it's this period in this early growth, these 10x growth rates, that very bad things can start to happen in these companies. The first thing is, they go through a time of heroes. You're growing like crazy, you have very limited talent, and guess what happens? Well, heroes step forward, and you have heroic things occurring with 26-year-olds. They do things far beyond what you'd expect them to do. And these stories of these heroes jumping into the breach often become some of the foundational stories of the company's history. And you see this, and you probably have in your own website stories of these people that did amazing things. But the fact is, eventually these guys get overextended and mistakes start happening. And the desire of the original team is somehow now we meet, need to move to a period of professionalization. And this has been one of the most important issues that we've seen when we've been working with founders is how do they move to this period of professionalization without destroying the culture? And it's very hard. And one of the things that occurs is they jump right from unsustainable heroes to flawed systems. And a lot of you will see that you've gone through this. You're trying to now put in systems as fast as you can. You're bringing in professionals, but a series of mistakes start happening. First is, often the original founders are asked to somehow codify their genius. They're asked to take all the decision-making and instinct and guts they had that drove the business and suddenly begin to put that into paper and to create manuals or create procedures to do what they did. And one of the things that the founders have said is I've now suddenly put everything I talk about in the business into a manual, and now my company is attracted to people that want to work by a manual. Who wants that? 
Second is they bring big company recruits into the business. So they get big brand names, people that have run big companies, and they bring them in. But the problem is these guys have an incumbent mindset. They've been administrators of large systems, but they've never built the system. And so they come in and they're in charge of supply chain. And the first thing is, by the way, we don't have a good supply chain, build it. And they're saying, well, I expect a staff of 45 people to administer an existing supply chain, not build one from scratch. There's a desire to harmonize everything. And so this is the notion that we've gone from every comp and bonus decision being made in the hallway by who sees the founder um, next to the lift to we now need to get to procedures and systems for all the right reasons. But this desire to harmonize means that we stop thinking about our talent and start defending our systems over our talent. And then what happens is somehow these companies feel they need to recruit like they're an incumbent. That somehow it's a good thing that they're big and bureaucratic and have systems and that's what they should recruit on. So come work with me because we're a winner. We're already safe. Instead of recruiting like you're an insurgent, this is going to be a wild ride. We have no idea what's going on. And so they begin to attract a different group of people. And what happens is the tier one talent, those 26 year olds don't like this company anymore. Um, we often talk to founders and say, would you join now the company you've created? And they pause way too long. And many times they say, I would never join the company I created. But also the new talent you're bringing in is the talent that likes procedures, likes harmonization salaries and bonuses, likes that you're an incumbent and you're getting exactly the people you don't want to come in and you have to get rid of them. At some point, the companies realize it and the talent gap actually gets far worse. And this is just one example that if you were aware that companies move from unscalable heroes to flawed systems, and if you could skip that step and move right to a time of balance, how much better would it be for a company's growth? If you're in that time of flawed systems, you need to unwind those if you expect to return to the sense of insurgency. And it's about how do you get your heroes to walk the halls again? How do you focus your recruiting on what we call the black sheep from blue chips? Don't find the great recruits with great brands that like to run incumbent organizations. Find the great recruits from best brands who were stifling there, who hated the bureaucracy and actually have an insurgent mindset. And then how do you use systems to support your heroes but never let your systems override the needs of your talent. There are also wins that even if you get to scale and scope that begin to drive companies down into this issue of struggling bureaucracies. What we call the southward win. The first is the curse of the matrix. And let's be clear here, um, the matrix is here to stay. The whole point of good organizational design is to create conflict. And it's because business is complex. You want your supply chain guy to try to drive costs out of everything by making the proposition the same, and you want your local market guy fighting for local market difference. The is issue is not the matrix. The issue is conflict resolution and the speed of conflict resolution. And so when we talk about the curse of the matrix, it's about has that led to such slow decision making that you're destroying the energy of your company? We talk about the fragmentation of the customer experience. As companies grow, aspects of what the customer sees and does with the company get spread across the bureaucracy. And pretty soon nobody is accountable for the customer. And one of the phrases that we often use is, who's the king of your organization? Who's the person actually completely accountable for delivering on the value proposition? And very often the companies can't define that. Well, that's spread across 23 people, we don't have anybody. And therein lies the problem. No one is accountable anymore for the customer. One of the paradoxes of growth is that growth creates complexity and complexity is the silent killer of growth. And that's at the core of the complexity doom loop is your own growth is creating the complexity that will kill you and will make it almost impossible to have strategy discussions. But the final one is the death of the nobler mission. The problem is as you move from insurgency to incumbency, you lose that mission. You were originally at war in your industry on behalf of a dissatisfied customer. And suddenly now you're the incumbent defending the industry, defending the rules of the game, defending your own economics, and no longer on the nobler mission. And your people realize it far before you do.
that that mission is gone. Let's take an example of a southward wind, which we call the complexity doom loop. Think about your company when you started. It was pretty simple. You had a leader, you had a customer, you had a front line, and there was absolute clarity about the product that you sold. And the lines were pretty clear. The CEO could talk to anybody in the front line. They didn't have to worry about hundreds of span breakers or various functional committees they need to be part of. Everybody understood the product and things were clear. But then things start getting very complex. For example, as you're talking now about the next percent of growth in your growth plan, you're facing much more portfolio complexity than you originally did. You've got more markets, more adjacencies, more product lines, more service offerings, and that creates complexity. You then try to organize around that and create organization complexity. And there's lots of debates about how to organize best to capture all these adjacent opportunities. And then people try to resolve them with grand ideas about what we'll do better with IT and information flows, and we create process complexity. And as one CEO of a company said, and then what happens is that complexity creates dissonance within the management team, which is its own complexity. And so a good day at the office is suddenly we've aligned. People stop talking about acting and doing anything, but they're very, very content that they've at least aligned. But the problem with complexity, it gets companies exhausted. Decisions and conflicts aren't being resolved. You give rise to the energy vampire. And the energy vampire are those people in the organization sucking the life out of your talent and people by constantly blocking their action. And then that leads to exhausted leaders. And then what happens, and I see this all the time in companies, is those leaders forget to do the one thing that leaders have to do, which is to simplify and try to deliver a strategy and a plan of action that is simple, but it takes massive energy to focus and be simple. So a lot of what we talk about is how do you strip that down again? How do you get back to where the lines are simpler? And I found it fascinating that when Tim Cook was asked shortly after Steve Jobs died, what is the one thing you learned from Steve Jobs? His answer was, I learned focus is key. So this is the journey we're on as we think about it. And a lot of the work we're doing is with insurgents and figuring out with them how to take a path north. And if I'm a large multinational incumbent right now, I'd be very frightened. Because if these guys can figure out a path north where they're gaining the benefits of the founder mentality and they're scaling, they are gonna be formidable competitors. But the other journey we're on is how do we take struggling bureaucracies, incumbents, and get them to rediscover this founder's mentality? Um, and often it's finding what was great at the company in their early history, rediscovering the elements of the insurgency and bringing them back in. And the final path of how you do this is actually quite fascinating. A lot of companies now are thinking about their partners as a means to bring back in the founder mentality. So it used to be automatically, if you think about um, uh, acquiring a company, your first job is to make it into yourself. And we are now seeing CEOs hesitate and say, actually, if I acquire a founder-led company, why don't I want that mentality to actually influence me? And so these are the three paths we're exploring as we think now about how insurgents or how incumbents grow sustainably and profitably by maintaining this founder's mentality. Thank you very much.